Um, today I'm going to talk about indexing videos in solar. So this talk is going to be a case study of a personal research project, which I've been working on for about two years, um, which is called findlectures.com. And I'm going to talk specifically today about indexing historic videos. So before I go too far, I'm going to do a really quick demo. So as a use case, imagine um, I'm interested in history. So um, and I'm, there's a few things that happened, you know, um, interesting political events that happened maybe when I was very young or before I was, you know, just before I was born or something, and they weren't necessarily well covered in school. So there's a few of these things that I'm aware of. And as an example, um, there's a fairly famous uh, speech by uh, George H.W. Bush where he uses the phrase, uh, read, my, read my lips, no new tactics. Research for this. Um, you can see here it, uh, something shows up with the highlighting where the, the, uh, with the timing. So this shows up apparently about 40 minutes into the speech. This is an accepted speech for the Republican convention. If we hit play, it's going to. Oh, and they'll push again, and I'll say to them, read my lips. No new taxes. All right. So that's the kind of thing I want to achieve with this search engine. Um, so I'm going to talk about three specific um, areas within that. Um, a lot of people have asked me about where I get data for this. I'm going to talk about that kind of briefly to give you some insight into how I'm thinking about this. Um, how this translates into use cases for um, the people who are using this, and then I have a machine learning example at the end. And my hope here is. If you're new to solar, this will give you some ideas for how to think about the kinds of problems you might encounter um, trying to set up a search engine. If you're not new to solar, I'm hoping this inspires some creative solutions to problems you might have. So this search engine started out as um, from a company lunch and learn that we run at Wingspan. A group of people get together, they find some videos. We found some good collections of content. Um, that ranges from tech conferences to uh, the historic type things that I'm talking about here. And the important thing about these is that if you're looking for something for, say, a lunch and learn, you want something that fits in a, you know, within an hour probably and something that's interesting and high quality. So one of the favorite collections that I have is this um, YouTube channel that comes from UCLA. And in the 1970s and 80s, they brought a lot of fairly famous people to their campus. Um, they've recorded all these, and they've somewhat recently digitized these. So there's about 500 of these videos. Um, the way you browse this on YouTube is you go through this infinite scrolling UI. So you see you know, 10 or 20 at a time, and hopefully you can eventually figure out what's in there. But it takes a while to get to the end. But what you can see in this is that the person who's uploaded these videos has put a lot of metadata in the titles and the descriptions of things. So there's something there. Um, it's just not exposed um, in this uh, system because that's not how YouTube works. So what I want to imagine then is, like, say we had something that was like a street view for history, where you could say, my parents were voting in some election in the past. What, would, what might have they have seen on TV, um, as an example, which is kind of where the, the, the first demo goes. So the, the direction of historic content for audio and video, I think, is kind of interesting. The earliest recordings actually date to the 1850s, but at the time they were really short because nobody knew how to play them back. So they, people were experimenting, they understood kind of how sound worked, but uh, you won't find very much of great interest at the time, nothing of particular quality. And the things that we think of as commercial use of audio starts then about 20 years later. Um, in 1912, Woodrow Wilson recorded a speech um, that he did. He was the first president to do something. So, um, we start to see the, the medium become used for more purposes. And concurrently with that, you see silent films develop. So um, it's not, um, there's, a, there's a period of time where there's two separate collections of media. You might find video and audio of the same person, but they're not ever going to be together because they didn't have the technology for it. And then in the 60s and 70s, we start to see the content that we're more familiar with. So there's a good period of um, well over 100 years where there's a lot of content that's out there, but it has to be digitized, and somebody has to go back and add metadata to it. And it's only fairly recently that we think of YouTube as a primary source um, for 
a lot of the content we, that we consume. Um, so I think that this, this older data set is really interesting and it has a nice property of being a little bit smaller than, for instance, like what YouTube is doing. So here I'm, I'm showing, uh, th these are three of the attributes that I'm using in faceting on the search engine. So there's, this, I'm trying to, as much as possible to collect the speakers who are in the, the talks, um, when something was given, and then the length of the content. So if you were gonna set out to collect information like this, and you're just gonna do it by hand, you can kind of imagine, um, say you go to a website, this is a example from a museum dedicated to preserving the interviews of a famous journalist called Mike Wallace. Um, and so each of the, the entries on this page are people he interviewed. So you can see here that there are um, years and titles and descriptions and there's links to transcripts. So if you're, as a developer, temptation is I open the developer console, I can write some piece of JavaScript to extract something from this page. That's pretty easy to do. Um, and if we were going more the route of looking at that earlier YouTube example, I can imagine writing a regular expression just pull the years out of the titles, which is actually works, um, I found it works actually really pretty accurately with a lot of these uh, data sets because most of the people who are uploading them are kind of librarian oriented people. So they're pretty good about putting correct stuff in. It's just not consistently formatted. And if we combine those two kind of concepts together, you can, if you're comfortable with JavaScript, jQuery type things, you could imagine starting to write uh, jQuery code to pull content off of somebody's website. And if you're doing this um, like I'm doing as a hobby research project, this works really well because a lot of sites have jQuery on them, so you can open up somebody's site, play around with it for a little while, and start working on extracting some piece of information pretty quickly. And a lot of, um, pretty much everybody's website is using some sort of content management tool anyway, so there's a ton of structure to it. And if you combine all of those things together, then you could build an object, you know, this is a JavaScript object, which um, represents all of the fields I'm interested in on the page. And what I found when I was researching this is there's actually a command line version of, or a Node.js version of jQuery um, that you can run. So if you do all this development in your browser, you can then kind of run this in the background doing this. Um, and so what this gives you then is basically custom scrapers for each site that you might be interested in. So when, you're, when I'm um, approaching actually crawling someone's website to get content out of it, um, here, um, I've shown on the, the left and the right, there's two sets of information that we might be able to obtain. So here, um, I've chosen an example, which is a university in the UK that's apparently had public lectures uh, for about 400 years. Um, the more recent ones, they record and put on their website. So on the left-hand side, we uh, go through the links on the website uh, recursively until we find all the things that look like talk URLs. Um, apply the JavaScript I showed you on the last page, and we start to get some information like the title of the video, we have a collection identifier for what the videos are, the speakers, descriptions, audio information. On the other side, this particular institution has a YouTube channel as well, and so you can get, you'll still get the title information, but you'll also get uh, your URLs to YouTube. Uh, YouTube does an automated transcript, which you can kind of extract, um, and then these will get combined together either on the YouTube identifier or the title if, um, if those match up correctly. Um, so these I'm storing somewhere and then after the fact, uh, run a series of scripts that get more information about these. So that is things like um, put these things into categories for audio, go and look for quality problems in the audio, like is it just in the left or the right channel? Is, it, um, is there a lot of clipping in the audio? And then also something that which periodically run to make sure the site is still there. So if the video disappears, that can be removed from the search engine. So having talked now a little bit about where I'm getting data, I wanna talk about um, two different paths through this application. So one is the historic research example I showed in the beginning, and the other is what, does somebody, what happens when somebody hits the site for the first time? I, one of the, things I decided to do is to try to make it so that you get a good experience, you get something back, even if you haven't typed a query in at all. 
So my assumption is a person coming into this is using it for the stated purpose, which is they just want to find something interesting. So I'm looking for things that are high quality of the appropriate length, and I'm trying to achieve some degree of novelty in the different topics that are represented on the front page. And the solution that I've come up with for this is to pick a list of these collections, which I've, are generally very, very good, filter out anything that has some sort of quality issue like um, being really heavy or not safe for work, uh, too technical maybe, or, or has audio problems, and then apply a little bit of randomization. What that gives you is every day you come to the site, you get something a little different. The experience is a little bit like Reddit, although it's less obvious because it's a search engine. Um, and then the fourth thing that I think is interesting to think about here is I'm ranking things which are embeddable in external sites. Um, this is a property that you can set on your YouTube videos if you upload them, prioritizing these higher. And the reason is I think that the user experience for this is better for the people who are using the site. So even though that's not necessarily a quality uh, feature per se, I think that's a valuable thing to improve the rank for. And you could kind of imagine if you're an e-commerce site, if you had, say, three of the same item, you might want to prioritize something that you could ship faster to somebody um, as being kind of a good comparable analogy here. In terms of the actual quality scoring, there's a whole bunch of different metrics um, that I'm trying to collect. And I think one of the, the, the first two I think are interesting because this shows some of the value of having this data set where you've added additional attributes. Like if you're pulling YouTube videos, there's no metadata particularly. Um, but you know, uh, if you're looking at conference talks, if somebody gave a keynote level, a keynote speech at some conference, the conference organizers have decided that this person is a keynote level speaker, so it's probably a pretty safe bet that the rest of their talks are pretty good. Um, and, and so you can start to let some of these things bleed across the collection, like from video to video, which um, I think is an interesting concept. So this is what um, the site ends up looking like when you um, just come into it cold. So now I, now I want to go down the other direction. So thinking about how to handle the historic search examples. So let's say um, we have a talk that's from 1985, and we want to store that in the index. We want to let people search for it different ways. So there's a bunch of different terms someone might come in searching for. Um, these aren't, uh, as I said, uh, these are, um, since there's only about 100 years of content, you probably wouldn't search for 1900s, but maybe you would. Um, so what I've chosen to do is to store different variations of the time information with the, the video. So you get, if you type in any one of these, you get um, these results back. And I think what's important here is now we're starting from, we have a collection of metadata, and we're starting to create some of our own metadata. So the next stage of this is to take the uh, transcripts that YouTube has automatically generated and try to run them through some API to see if we can get a taxonomy. So here, I've, um, the one where I've been the most successful was the uh, IBM Watson's API. This is a, uses a company that they acquired that um, does a whole bunch of different NLP tasks. So the value of this taxonomy is it has a nice hierarchy and there's a lot of different tags. And the downsides of some of these taxonomies, though, is that there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of people have asked me, like, for instance, why I wouldn't use the Library of Congress taxonomy system. And their system is um, significantly richer. There's, like, uh, potentially, like, tens of thousands of tags. So you need to have some sort of data set that you can train a machine learning model on. Um, so you end up being kind of forced into things which people are already doing. So the taxonomy that someone already has out there ends up being really valuable. But one way that you can extend this is by running through a second API that they provide, which is their Entity Recognition API. And for the people who aren't familiar with it, Entity Recognition is a uh, set of algorithms that will detect terms that have a specific meaning to them based on context. So um, here I've shown some talks which uh, have health terms in them. The, the API um, sort of learns how to recognize health terms from previous examples it's seen, so it can recognize terms it hasn't seen before. Um, and one of the disadvantages here, um, in their API, for instance, it will pick up things like the Great Depression as depression, which is obviously not appropriate for an actual health term. Um, it, it may be interesting to ask here, I said this talk was going to be about history, why I've chosen um, 
health here as an example, um, because this is not really a historical example. Um, and one of the things I found is if you put in um, ask Watson for countries as entities, it returns these particular phrases, which I guess you could, strictly speaking, they're countries, but you kind of would expect it maybe that they would start from a list of actual territories or countries and filter down to um, valid things. And so I think what, the, what this poses then is, is an interesting problem is how you deal with something like propaganda in a historical search engine. So rather than, I'm going to use these two examples of terms which I think will probably be familiar to some people as examples of things that you can do and to demonstrate some of the things you can do with a search engine. So the first term I have here is the phrase axis of evil. And for the people who are familiar with this, um, this result might be expected. But this shows up in about 2002 and disappears, kind of disappears from speeches about um, eight years later. And you see that George W. Bush is the one president um, who used this. These are just screenshots of the, the faceting part of the UI. And what someone had pointed out to me that I think is interesting about a search engine with a lot of facets is that sometimes you can learn a lot if you're just trying to educate yourself in some way from just from poking around the facets without even looking at the results. So when these get stored in the search engine, um, I'm choosing to store the uh, a simplified version of closed captions. So closed captions, uh, the way that they're normally represented is you have a start and an end time and some piece of text. Um, this here, I'm just putting the start time in. And you can see um, in the example where the axis of evil thing comes in. But sometimes when you pull uh, machine generated transcripts, there will be a lot of problems with them. Um, in the video that I showed you at the very beginning, um, the applause starts right around the time um, he says the phrase that we're looking for, so the, the transcript generator thing gets confused, so we actually lose the most famous uh, phrase probably from the speech. So what I found is for some of these, uh, for things that are really well-known speeches, you can, typically you can find transcripts which have been written out by someone just by hand. They just don't have the timings in them. And so you could imagine taking um, the transcript and matching up the words that do match against the, uh, the words in the auto transcripts and kind of inserting, uh, uh, just noting that there's gaps where things don't um, exist. And there's actually a pretty um, well-researched uh, computer science area within this, which is uh, used for algorithms used for DNA uh, trans uh, recombination. Um, and so what I found by doing this is, uh, at least in some experiments, is that if you take the transcripts and you run one of these uh, DNA reconstruction algorithms, search type things against the transcript and the auto transcript, you can take the timings from the closed caption uh, data and insert them into the transcript and get a pretty good result. So you can actually search what the transcript was supposed to be. So when this is stored in solar, what I'm doing is using a regular expression to filter down, uh, to filter out the the numbers at the beginning of the, uh, the uh, closed captions, because you don't want people to search for the closed caption timings. And then um, once you actually go do a search, um, this is the America First example. Um, you'll find, um, in this case, uh, Charles Lindbergh, a World War II era um, famous pilot, was involved in some uh, particular organization named after this. And you start, so you start to see his name show up as a person who used this phrase, and then you'll, if you scroll through this further, you'll see the US president, Warren Harding, shows up as well. And so the obvious next step is to say, well, if we're embedding a YouTube video, we can put the timing um, in the URL. This is a pretty standard YouTube feature. And then you get the example that I sh an example like what I showed you in the beginning, of, except this is the axis of evil example, but a similar speech. So for the final example, I want to talk a little bit about generating recommendations. So there's a um, fairly well-known book now, a biography of Alexander Hamilton by this author, Ron Chernow. Um, this book was the inspiration for the musical. So if we go to Amazon and we search for this, they show us uh, recommendations based on things people have purchased. Uh, so other people, people have bought this guy's books. What other authors do these people read? And then it shows us other books he's written. Um, if we go to 
Google, they're doing a clickstream analysis type thing, I believe. And so if you type in this guy's name and then you say Ron Chernow website, eventually they'll pick up the pattern. Um, and the downside to both of these approaches is it requires you to have a fair amount of users and it assumes that your users have knowledge that you want to extract, which I don't think is always the case in either case. So one option that's tempting is to try to use Wikipedia as a data set. Um, obviously they have the information, um, but we do see sometimes that there's a lot of noise. So in this case, um, they show in this guy's bio every honorary degree that he's received, which isn't, I don't think is particularly useful for this uh, recommendation purpose. And so the solution that I found to this is that someone has taken um, Wikipedia articles and trained a word to vec model on them. Um, for people who aren't familiar with it, word to vec is sort of famous for having just being able to discover relationships between uh, terms in text. So the canonical example that everyone uses in articles is um, trained on some data set in some paper. Um, it learns that king is to queen as man is to woman, and you, these are mathematical vectors that you can add and subtract. So you can do king, mi uh, king minus man plus woman, and you get something that's close to queen. Um, in this um, particular model, what they do is to take wherever there's a link in a Wikipedia article, they leave the, um, they use a DVPD identifier instead, so you can actually find multi-word tokens in this thing. So I spent some time trying to figure out if the, the adding and subtracting thing actually worked um, on the data set in this model. And this particular example um, came out pretty well. So if you take what it sees as the term for um, the concept of what Gloria Steinem is, subtract person, add ideology, you get a bunch of words related to feminism, which is appropriate, I think. But it, it's also important to realize that the way word to vec works is it just reads words in context around the terms it's looking at. So it's not making any particular value judgments or necessarily defining the term. It's just saying these things um, tend to get used together in the same context, which conceptually I think is actually fairly similar to the Amazon example. So the DBpedia side of this, um, if you haven't heard of it, DBpedia is like Wikipedia, but it's got a lot of data. You can get a lot of ton of trivia in JSON form. So they have things like which US presidents were left-handed or right-handed, including the data set. Um, but conceptually, it's like the cards on the right-hand side of Wikipedia. And if you want to go from having an identifier in your data set to actually finding something, you have to use this language called Sparkle, which is hard to read. Um, but what, what you get out of this is you can do things like say, is this identifier in this model referring to a person? And what's the actual name? Um, so what if they've done is taken this um, against the data set I have and then um, pulled out all these, um, the information for each of these things. Um, so the answer you get for some of these, um, it seems pretty convincing, I think. Um, this is the top the vectors which are closest to Martin Luther King Jr. You see people involved in the civil rights movement. You see Martin Luther, which is not really relevant, but the rest of them, I think, are. Um, and if you follow this down further, you'll find some people who had like radio shows at the same time period. Um, so it seems like, at least from this example, it seems like it's working pretty well. If we take a topic instead, um, like the Vietnam War, we get some other things which seem appropriate. Um, other wars and other um, articles for uh, countries that are relevant. So the way I've chosen to store this in the index that I have is just to take um, the terms that I think people might search for, which are going to be the titles of these articles, store the um, suggestions that I want with it. Um, in this case, the, the beginning of this example is Ron Chernow. These are all um, people who have written biographies, historians, um, people who are interested in Revolutionary War history, um, and then this is what it ends up looking like in the search. So those are the examples I have. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I found um, the book called Relevant Search is really, really helpful. Um, if you want to, um, I've researched some of the um, dealing with the actual uh, images in the videos, and um, in particular, there's a research area around extracting the slides that people have from videos. And it's particularly tricky when you have um, you know, slides next to a person. Um, so there's a 
similar search engine um, called TalkMiner. They wrote a paper about some of the AI type things that they're doing. If you're interested in the um, extracting like text from videos examples, that's a good reference. Um, and then these are some tools that I've been exploring. Um, Deep Learning for J and GenSim are the good, the best starting points for the word to vec examples. And then the last two things are UI frameworks. Um, included in this, this search engine, if anyone's interested, um, there's a sign up that you can go to that um, I'm sending out the things that we've used for Lunch and Learns that people really like. Um, you can also message me on Twitter if you're interested. Um, my employer is hiring if you want to work with solar all the time. We have a position open um, that we're looking to fill. Um, and uh, does anybody have any questions? So, yeah, so the question was, do I always use the text that I have for the video, or is there a way to extract text from the audio? Um, what I've done is, I mean, I take whatever is available, and then subsequently, if there's audio, run, try to, if there's, no, if there's audio and there's no text, try to run that through some API or something. Um, I've gone through and tested some people, different people's APIs that way. Um, but that's also something that can get expensive pretty quickly. Any other questions? So, yeah, so the, the question is if I've thought about doing voice recognition against these things. So um, I hadn't considered. Um, that specifically, but one thing I think would be interesting with this data set would be to try to do like facial recognition on this, because I think there's a lot of talks where, um, especially like people who present at a lot of conferences, you can find a lot of examples of like what somebody looks like, and I think it would be interesting to try to take and match that up, and you could probably do the same thing with voice. Anything else? It's about 200, the question is how many videos are indexed? It's about 200,000. Um, and I've ten, tended to try to operate more towards getting just higher quality things, so I'm less concerned with the actual number because I'd rather just have stuff that's good. So 50 good ones is better than 1,000 mediocre ones. So the question is how I'm dealing with difficulty levels in these things. And I don't have a good answer to that. That's something I've, there's been a, I've done a bunch of experiments on different things. So um, you can do like text analysis and say like what's the difficulty level of this. Um, you can do like how common are the, how common is the vocabulary that the person uses in their talk. Um, and then you can also, like, by being able to do things with the faceting, you can, like, let people filter down to areas that are of interest. So right now the filtering is basically, is this a tech conference video or is it not? Um, but there's other, there's other things I've explored, just nothing's worked out well enough to, to give a talk about. Anything else? All right.